Thank you for joining us and welcome to the exam room live. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Welcome to the healthiest half hour or so anywhere on the internet today. Appreciate you taking time right here on Facebook and YouTube. On tap today, we have the best-selling author, a public health nutritionist, and just an all-around extraordinary woman. Tracy McWhorter is here to talk about her incredible program, 10,000 black vegan women. Tracy, cannot wait to jump into this with you. I'm great. I'm, I'm glad to be here, and it's great to see you again, Chuck. The pleasure is all mine. Stand by. We're going to come back to you in just a second. And you who is watching this right now, get your questions ready, my friend, because Dr. Vanita Rahman, she will be joining us as we open up the doctor's mailbag. So if there's anything on your mind regarding health or nutrition, anything, go ahead and post that in the comment section. Now, Dr. Rahman, I'm sure a lot of people are just chomping at the bit to get some answers today. Hi, Chuck. Good to be here. All right. We start, though, with a health headline and a look at mental health, because a rapidly growing number of us, it seems, could use a little bit of help. A new survey finds that the number of Americans experiencing psychological distress has more than tripled recently. Researchers at Johns Hopkins say more than 13.5% of adults reported feeling distressed compared to less than 4% just two years ago. The survey also finds the feelings are more common in households with annual earnings under $35,000. But it is adults between the ages of 18 and 29 who are being hit the hardest. Nearly one out of every four now say that they are stressed out. That's a six and a half times greater number than in 2018. Long-term exposure to stress has been linked to a number of chronic conditions, including heart disease and depression, and even a 2013 study linked stress to an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. The good news? Multiple studies have also linked plant-based diets with lower levels of stress and anxiety. So stress, we just heard that more of us are feeling it perhaps more than ever. So let's talk about something positive. Let's get some good news here on the exam room live. And for that, I want to welcome Tracy McWhorter onto the show. She will be our bearer of good news today. She's the author of The Ageless Vegan and By Any Greens Necessary. And now she is continuing to embark on this incredible mission to help others lead a healthier life through her program, 10 thousand black vegan women. Tracy, so glad you could join us today. Thank you so very much for making the time. Thank you, Chuck. It's so good to be talking to you again. The pleasure is all mine, my friend. Now you, for those who aren't familiar, you have actually been vegan for more than 30 years, 33 years, according to your website. And I, I'm just curious, what inspired you 33 years ago to adopt that plant-based diet? Well, uh, vegan. So despite my mother's best efforts, I, I was, you know, we were pretty health conscious as omnivores growing up and I didn't like it. And then uh, when I was in college at Amherst College, our Black Student Union brought Dick Gregory to campus to talk about the state of Black America. And instead he talked about um, the plate of Black America and how unhealthfully most folks eat. This was 1986. And he had already been a vegan for 20 years because of his practice of nonviolence during the civil rights movement that he extended to animals starting in 65. Um, so he came and did a talk um, connecting all of the dots uh, about food justice, about um, why we eat the way we eat, culture, politics, economics. And uh, he also traced the path of a hamburger from a cow in a factory farm through the slaughterhouse process to a fast food restaurant, to a clogged artery, to a heart attack. And that entire talk rocked my world. And uh, that really was the spark. I mean, I immediately gave up hamburgers and hot dogs and that was no small feat for a week. Um, and then that was no small feat for me because I had gained 25 pounds my first year, the year before. And because I was eating hamburgers and hot dogs and desserts all the time, I never ate vegetables. Um, so, you know, you can imagine how powerful his talk was if it made me immediately give up meat, but it didn't, it didn't last longer than a week. 
Um, but I did begin to do my own research and study. And back at that time, you know, this was before the internet. So you had to physically go to the library. So when I went back home to DC, I went to the Library of Congress and uh, Martin Luther King Library and read everything that was available about vegetarianism. And my mother and one of my sisters did too. And by the end of that summer, um, about, uh, so this is probably a total of about six months later, I decided to go vegetarian. And then uh, I took my junior year away. I went to Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya for the first semester. I couldn't be vegan there, but being on safari for two weeks and seeing animals in their own environment and then having one of those animals served to us on our last night of safari at a restaurant sealed the deal for me that I would never eat another animal again. I came back to DC, went to Howard University for the next semester and discovered this large black vegan community in Washington, DC, immersed myself in this community. They taught me everything that Dick Gregory, uh, they expanded what Dick Gregory was teaching me. And uh, so during that semester and the summer, I became a committed vegetarian again, and then it would take me another year to let go of cheese. So that's, that's my vegan story. It, it, man, it, it, so many people just struggle with that last little step, don't they? And I'll tell you another thing. So all of this happened 30, 33 years ago now. And I'm looking at you and I'm like, 33 years ago, it looks like at most you were in elementary school. So I guess that's why your book is called The Ageless Vegan, right? <laughs> uh, I'll take it. Thank you. I'll be for this year. Um, and I mean, you know, I have a good genes from my family, you know, uh, but that definitely, I think, you know, that it makes a huge difference, primarily because I eat a whole food plant based diet and have been doing that for all of my adult life so far, starting when I was in my, you know, starting when I was 20. Um, so it does make a huge difference. And my mother actually started when she was in her 50s. She's, she'll be 84 this year, and she is also doing well with no chronic diseases. So um, for everyone, I tell them that it, it, you can start at any age, um, you'll feel the effects immediately, particularly if you stress whole plant-based foods uh, for the, the primary part of what you eat. All right. Now, right now we're seeing all of these trends, so many people turning to a vegan diet. But what a lot of people don't know is that African-Americans, that demographic is actually the fastest growing when it comes to plant-based eating. And this is really, it's nothing new. There's a lot of deep-rooted history and significance here. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So, um, yes, 8% of African Americans are vegan and vegetarian as compared to 3% of um, everyone else in this country. Um, so that's, a, that's very significant. But we have a long tradition of eating um, healthy plant-based foods. Obviously, um, our ancestors, our African ancestors were eating uh, plant-centered, plant-focused. Um, and then in our, the uh, 400 years uh, that we've been here in the States, um, you know, during enslavement, we did not, uh, you know, we were forced to eat what we were uh, provided. And, but even then, you know, folks were doing as much as they could to cultivate their own plant-based foods. And then after enslavement, um, through Reconstruction, through uh, Jim Crow, through the Civil Rights, through uh, migration to Northern cities and the West. And for folks who stayed in the South, we continued this agrarian tradition. So in fact, African-Americans have been plant-based, plant-centered, plant-focused for a very long time. And specifically vegan, we're leaders in this movement as well. I mean, I mentioned Dick Gregory, who became vegan in 1965 because of the Civil Rights Movement. Well, he was actually taught to go vegan in 67 for health reasons by a woman named Dr. Alvinia Fulton, a naturopath who had started the very first vegan establishment on the south side of Chicago in the 1950s. She learned about that from her grandparents. So um, these are just some examples. Rosa Parks, Coretta Scott King, Angela Davis. There's so many um, folks, particularly Black women, because that's who I focus on who have been promoting veganism for a very long time. So I always say that there's always been this, this stream or this river of black folks who have been leaders and pioneers since we've been in this country. 
uh, in veganism. And, and also, let's not forget Seventh Day Adventist. Um, Oakwood University in Alabama was the first uh, African American Seventh Day Adventist university. And when they started in the late 1890s, they were vegetarian. Um, so again, we have a long tradition, this stream, this river of, of black folks who've been vegan and vegetarian next to this larger ocean of folks who have been eating, uh, who are omnivore and eating the standard American diet over the generations. All right. So you, you, your focus is on black women and, and you just launched this incredible program. You're gearing up for it in the fall. 10 thousand black vegan women. Talk to us a little bit about this program. Why is this so important to you? Well, um, this is important to me because, you know, while black women, African American women are leaders in so many progressive ways, the vast, you know, we have a tradition of leading and being vegan in this country. Many of us, the vast majority of us are in a health crisis and we can't tiptoe around this issue. There are lots of organizations that are working around Black women's health, um, but not many focus specifically on Black women going vegan, Black women going plant-based and, and, and eating whole food plant-based uh, diets to improve their health. So for example, in terms of this health crisis that Black women are, are experiencing, we have the highest rates of, de of uh, heart disease. We, 49% of us have heart disease, 50,000 black women die every year. That's about 140 women every day from cardiovascular disease. So that's heart attack, heart disease, stroke. 13% uh, of us have diabetes. So not only are we living with diabetes but we're, and dying from diabetes, but we're having higher rates of amputation, sometimes 500 times as high as everyone else. And that can lead to uh, also um, blindness, cataracts, glaucoma, kidney failure. Um, and also unhealthy weight is an issue. 56% of black women are considered obese and unhealthy weight leads to these chronic diseases as well. So there are a lot of reasons um, for these conditions. There are lots of reasons that we are experiencing these conditions. Um, the foundation of which is 400 years of systemic white supremacy in this country that has led to uh, uh, food injustice. So in uh, low income black communities around the country, you have what's called food apartheid, limited or no access to healthy whole plant based foods. Um, and uh, you also have issues of impoverishment. You have issues. I mean, and that's foundational also. Um, and then just the fact that folks are dealing with stressors of, you know, everyday living and uh, living in, the, in uh, environments that aren't as healthy, that are more polluted. Um, and then we've been targeted by fast food companies since, since the 1960s. After the assassination of King in 68, fast food companies partnered with the government to come in and establish franchises uh, of, um, of fast food companies so that, you know, there could be some kind of economic opportunity that was not present before that. And so that was a double edged sword. Obviously, McDonald's and these kinds of companies aren't healthy, but it was providing employment for young people. So black community leaders were promoting it. Um, and what that did was before those fast food companies proliferated, more African Americans were eating plant based and were meeting the USDA guidelines for uh, whole grains and for fruits and vegetables than the rest of the country. But after the proliferation, when the when that uh, research was done again in the 70s, that had totally switched and more African Americans were eating fast food in the standard American diet. So we have to understand that this, this has all been by design and the reasons for this. But that all said, we have the power to take back control of our health. And that's what this program is all about. I am all about changing the health paradigm of black women because it's completely unacceptable that we are this unhealthy. It's not necessary, it's preventable. And my passion in life is to help as many black women as I can go vegan to live longer, healthier lives. 
Well, I can tell you, you already made somebody's day. Danya on YouTube just commented, as a black vegan woman, I had no idea that there were so many other black vegan women out there. I'm one month in, so already, you know, this, this is fantastic. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Congratulations on your transition. And that's just one person. You announced the 10,000 Black Vegan Women campaign a few months ago. I know you were on the actual podcast uh, talking about this, the Exam Room podcast. Now, what has the response been since the initial announcement? The response has been phenomenal. So uh, I soft launched it in February thinking that we would start in May and then COVID-19 happened. So I pushed it back to October. But already we've had almost 4,500 women sign up for the program. We average about 50 people a day signing up for the program. So we are well on our way to meeting and hopefully surpassing our goal of 10,000 women um, by October. Um, Maya, um, a Grammy winning singer, a longtime vegan has endorsed us um, and promoted us. Um, hopefully we'll have other folks coming on board in the coming months as well um, to endorse us as well. And so, um, you know, I'm just really excited that people are excited about this initiative. It's it's absolutely free. Uh, coming in October, we'll be going vegan together for 21 days for October, November, and December with meal plans, recipes, grocery shopping lists done for you, tips, guides, um, coaching, group coaching from me. So there will be a lot going on. It's all free. And uh, if folks sign up now, they get weekly newsletters from me with expert vegan tips um, that they can use right now. And they get to download a 14 page weekend vegan uh, two day jumpstart, which is a guide with eight scrumptious recipes from Ageless Vegan, a, do a done for you grocery shopping list so that they can go ahead and get started right away. Yeah, I think that that's just it. You know, you're talking about a program that's going to start in October. You're getting everybody all inspired. They're like, no way. Like, we, we got to get going on this today. So you have a two-day program. That's fantastic. And by the way, the recipes are are just phenomenal. Um, I want... I want to switch gears just a second because you mentioned COVID-19 and one of the things that we've been reporting on here at the exam room is that African Americans are dying in the highest numbers in this pandemic. Can you talk to us a little bit about why that is happening? Right. Well, I mean, the fact is that um, African Americans already were, ex were experiencing higher rates of chronic diseases, right? So we had these comorbidities already before the pandemic happened. And so when you have a pandemic on top of that, it's going to exacerbate those conditions. You have folks who are, um, you know, impoverished or low income who have fewer resources in their community who are more likely to be essential workers. And so they're going, they're more likely to be exposed to the virus. Um, and then, you know, underlying, you know, underlying all of this, the chronic diseases, the, 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 um, the lack of resources by design in black communities and low income communities, especially uh, in cities is structural racism, is systemic white supremacy. And so this should not be a surprise that when you have a pandemic coming on top of this, the people who have, the, the, who have been um, deprived of the most resources, so therefore have the least access to healthy food, to um, better uh, health care, to uh, jobs that allow them to work from home, um, to better uh, uh, living environments and living conditions, these folks are going to be the hardest hit. And that is exactly what we're seeing. So we're seeing with COVID-19, with this pandemic, that it's putting in stark relief the conditions that already existed um, for African Americans in this country. Let's talk about those conditions, the underlying conditions specific yeah. to African American women, because you mentioned earlier just the alarming rate of obesity among African American women. What are the other numbers saying right now? Yeah, 50, 56% of Black women are obese, 80% are overweight. Um, we know that there's some issue around body mass index uh, um, in that it's, it's, the standard is white women, and we, you know, and and in terms of our body uh, shapes, 
we tend to be curvier. Um, but even within that, you know, there's a, there is unhealthy weight as an issue. And so the higher you are towards obesity and within the obesity realm, the higher you are uh, towards the end of that, the less healthy you're going to be. So uh, unhealthy weight, and in this case, overweight and obesity is a serious problem for black women. And then again, you have 13% of black women who are, um, who have diabetes. You have 49% of black women who um, have heart disease. That's almost uh, one out of two black women. And for black women who are listening, for African Americans, you know, men and women who are listening, young people, uh, we know this personally. We either have these conditions ourselves or we know that our mother, we know of people in our family who are experiencing these conditions now or have died from them. So our, our mother, a sister, an aunt, a daughter, a cousin, a friend, a coworker, everyone knows somebody because it is so prevalent in our community. And again, you know, I spoke about why this is um, and, you know, that's, there's a lot to unpack there, but the bottom line is that um, most of these chronic diseases that we die from are preventable. And one of the best ways to do that is to eat a whole food plant-based diet. Yeah, I love the way that you, you know, segued so nicely into that because I call you the bearer of good news on today's show. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about that whole food plant-based diet. If, not if, when 10,000 black vegan women and more go vegan, what kind of changes can they expect to their health conditions? Well, you know, we can expect that folks will see changes right away. And I'll give you an example. Um, there's a woman who, uh, you know, signed up for the program on May 1st. And uh, the last week in May, she wrote me and said, uh, you know, I signed up on May 1st. Um, I, I uh, downloaded the guide. I ate the recipes from the guide and I've continued eating vegan. I've lost 13 pounds. My blood pressure has gone down and I can't thank you enough for this program. That is in a matter of three weeks. She lost 13 pounds and her blood pressure has dropped. This is common. You can expect to see results in uh, between one to three weeks if you are eating whole food, plant-based, mostly or exclusively. And um, if you are doing it consistently, then you can maintain these benefits. So, you know, obviously it depends on your health when you start. So if you're somebody who's experiencing diabetes, if you're somebody who's experiencing overweight or obesity, if you're somebody who has high blood pressure, high cholesterol, you can expect to see all of these conditions start improve, to start improving within the first few weeks of being in the program, especially if you are eating 100% or as close to 100% vegan as possible. So, you know, Chuck, it's really not rocket science. It's just eating whole food plant-based. And um, the only reason that we're not seeing more people eat this way is because we have been denied this information. Um, we're just not taught it. We have to seek it out. And so this is a way for people to join with other, uh, you know, like-minded folks to, to find out about this information and to go through this together. Clearly, a lot of the problems we're discussing here are absolutely nothing new, dating back generations and longer. But do you think more recently the COVID-19 pandemic has made people maybe a little bit more health conscious? I do. I do. I mean, the fact that, you know, we're seeing that it hits um, Black folks the most um, because of these existing chronic conditions that we're already experiencing, I think, as I said, has, has brought this into sharp focus. Um, and so folks are understanding that maintaining health, uh, maintaining their good health is important. So, you know, hopefully there will be another, there will not be another pandemic. Um, hopefully, you know, the, the food industry, particularly the meat and dairy factory farming industry 
will drastically change so that that does not happen in this country again or elsewhere around the world. But, you know, it's about more than finding ways to boost your immune system during the pandemic. The way to deal with this is to maintain a healthy weight uh, throughout your life. And so when something like this occurs, if something like this occurs again, you are better able to withstand it. And so, yes, I think that people are understanding that more because we are in this pandemic and they are seeing that Black folks, because we have these ex existing conditions, are experiencing it more and they want to find a way out. They want to find a way to get healthier. And so they are absolutely seeking out, seeking out more information, particularly about um, plant-based diets. Clearly a lot of work to be done, but you are to be commended because you are just, you are not running away. You are tackling this head on. You're already almost halfway to the 10,000 mark and it's nowhere near October yet. So yeah. I think I, you're going to hit that and you're just going to blow right on past it. You might as well add another zero, Tracy. Thank you, Chuck. I take it. I take it. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I think that I'm really excited. I think we will um, make the make that mark. And it's not just the 10,000 women, but it's the ripple effect because, you know, in focusing on women, we also impact their partners and their family members, their friends, their social circles. So it has a, a, the potential to really be impactful in that way. And add Tracy to your social circle at by any greens on Twitter and Instagram and the website to sign up right now, 10,000 black vegan women.com. You can see that right there on your screen. Tracy McWhorter, thank you so very much for taking the time. You are just the absolute best. Thank you, Chuck. Thanks for having me back. You take good care. You as well. Thank you so much. We will talk to you again soon. All right, time now to open up the doctor's mailbag. And Dr. Vanita Rahman, she is going to be answering as many of your questions as humanly possible before the end of the show today. So go ahead and post yours in the comments section right now. We just touched on a lot of things. So maybe you've got questions about heart disease or diabetes, obesity, any number of those things. Go ahead and post that in the comments section now. We're going to get to as many as we poss possibly can. Dr. Rahman, I know that you are ready to join us and answer as many many of these as you possibly can. You ready for the first one? Let's do it. All right. Here's one that comes up quite a bit, especially in terms of obesity here, right? A lot of people are cautious about their weight and they think that smoothies might actually put the weight on. So Stephanie has a question. What are your thoughts on drinking smoothies? I know some believe that you should eat all of your food. And then there are some who think that smoothies can be a good way to get the nutrients. Other people think they will make you put on weight. So what is your opinion? So this, you know, this does come up a lot and it's all of those choices are correct, essentially. So smoothies can be a great way to blend in fruits and vegetables and get various um, ingredients that people may not enjoy eating. So they can be tempting. But at the same time, sometimes smoothies can also be calorically dense, depending on what's going in them. If there are a lot, a lot of nuts or nut butters or seeds going into them or coconut or chocolate they can become calorically dense really quickly. So um, if you want to enjoy the occasional smoothie, you know, or even enjoy it regularly, the key is to keep the ingredients whole and healthy. Stick with fruits and vegetables. Avoid adding nuts or nut butters or seeds or coconut or chocolate These or avocado. These are high fat foods that will add calories that could lead to weight gain. And then um, just eat a sensible portion of a smoothie, you know, stick to eight ounces. Um, and if you are struggling with your weight, um, you might want to just refrain from smoothies and stick with eating those fruits and vegetables instead, because then as you're eating them, you're chewing and swallowing and doing the work that the blender would have done for you. So you're burning more calories as you enjoy it. Ah, all right. Linda on YouTube, I've been plant-based for over a year now, but being home, I am constantly looking for something to snack on. But I'm getting tired of celery and carrots and pepper sticks. So what suggestions do you have, Dr. Rahman? Oh my goodness, there are so many. Um, fruits are great. So keep a fruit bowl around the house. One of my favorite snacks, if you haven't tried it, is freezing your grapes. So when they're really juicy and ripe, um, just pluck them off the stems, put them in a bowl and freeze them. And they make a delicious treat, especially now in the summer, they almost taste like sorbet. Um, and then you can try different things like 
boil some lentils or chickpeas and mix them with some fruits and veggies and make a salad and that can make a great snack. And if you're bored with your carrot sticks, um, try dipping them in something like hummus or salsa that could spice things up a little bit. So, um, you know, lots of different options and finger sandwiches. Um, you can make like an avocado cucumber sandwich, cut it up into little squares and keep those around. So um, no need to stick with just carrots or celery that you're sick of. So many things to enjoy. Oh, but carrots and hummus, that's one of the greatest combinations ever. Matter of fact, I started a debate on Twitter recently when I said that carrots and hummus were the new peanut butter and jelly. It's just so good. And you had about, it, I mean, you want to talk about a split decision right down the middle. Carrots and hummus, peanut butter and jelly. Where do you weigh in? Oh, uh, as far <laughs> as health, definitely carrots and hummus. Um, Peanut butter and jelly, um, while I love them, they're delicious, but peanut butter can be um, very calorically dense. It can lead to weight gain. Um, it could raise blood sugar. So I'd go with the hummus and carrots any day. All right. Because you have that medical degree, your vote counts twice. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> all right. Question from Sander on YouTube. Does being vegan make you less susceptible for viruses altogether? Not talking specifically about COVID-19. You know, great question. So one thing we know that we're learning with this COVID-19 pandemic is our immune system can malfunction in two ways. On the one hand, it may not work properly and not protect us adequately enough, so increasing our risk for infection. And then on the other hand, it can be hyperactive and cause this intense inflammatory reaction that doesn't actually help us, but it actually makes things worse. And we're seeing that with COVID-19 where the immune system is revved up too much and that causes problems. So, and, and at the same time, there are people who are more susceptible to the infection because of their underlying health. So what we're seeing more and more is that a healthy plant-based diet can modulate the immune system in both ways. It can strengthen it, so helping us fight infection but at the same time, it also prevents it from being hyperactive. So um, it's helping it find just the right balance of protecting us, but not so much that it's hurting us along the way. Uh, just a quick uh, thing. I'm noticing in the comment section, a gentleman by the name of Richard uh, says that uh, he's been, uh, his blood sugar is fantastic, even though he's eating potatoes. So, uh, th and that's, that's another myth, right? That fruit and potatoes, they can send your blood sugar sky high. Yeah, that just gets back to the old theory that diabetes is a disease where blood sugar levels are high. So if we want to lower those blood sugar levels, we should minimize how much sugar or carbohydrates we're eating uh, because sugar is a type of carbohydrate. So people were traditionally taught to avoid fruits, avoid starchy foods like potatoes or pasta. And what we know is that's actually not what raises blood sugar. Although it seems intuitive, that's not what it is. It's really the amount of fat in our diet. So enjoy the fruits, enjoy the potatoes, enjoy the pasta. Um, they're healthy, they're nutritious. Um, just one word about potatoes, just avoid frying them. Um, baked, steamed, boiled, all those are great options. Yeah, nothing wrong with a roasted potato. Quite tasty, quite, quite tasty. Cameron on YouTube, are there any connections between plant-based eating and hormonal balances? Yeah, so this is, you know, a very exciting area. And we know that um, in a variety of conditions, whether it's polycystic ovary um, syndrome for women or um, erectile dysfunction for men, there is a hormonal imbalance that's causing all sorts of problems. And we think that a lot of that has to do with our diet and switching to a whole food plant-based diet can help. So we have some evidence that Women um, who have irregular cycles, their cycles can become more regular. Um, they can go on to have healthy pregnancies. And similarly for men, sometimes, um, you know, the number one treatment actually for erectile dysfunction um, is lifestyle changes. Um, and that means diet, exercise. And that is something that often gets overlooked, but that can have a profound impact. So there is this very um, strong connection, um, something we're still researching and figuring out, but it all looks very promising. Here's a great question from KC, sticking with the potato thing. I'm trying to cut the oils, but I love mashed potatoes and baked potatoes with vegan butter. Any substitute ideas for that oily vegan butter? Oh yeah. Um, so great question. Vegan butter, um, you know, is 
healthier than traditional dairy butter in that it doesn't have cholesterol, but it still has the same amount of fat. It's still not a nutritionally dense food, but it's a very calorically dense food. So best to avoid. Um, so for your mashed potatoes, you could try, um, you know, um, crushed garlic with, um, you can saute that with some soy milk or some other vegan based milk, and then blend your potatoes with that. And that can be a great option. I know on our website at pcrm.org, we have several recipes, but there are absolutely ways to make those mashed potatoes tasty without adding vegan butter or oil. It usually involves some kind of nut milk um, or maybe even a little bit of nuts just to give it that creaminess. All right, question from Danya. Does a plant-based diet improve the quality of your hair? I always hear so much about skin improvements, but not so much with the hair with a vegan diet. Yeah, so <laughs> great question, Danya. Uh, you know, we hear about the vegan glow that people get, and it is true that um, that think skin conditions like acne or eczema can improve with a plant-based diet. Um, now, as far as hair, we we don't know. I don't know if we have enough research to tell us, but um, certainly thinning of hair or hair loss can be related to hormonal imbalances. So, as we learn more about the connection between diet and hormonal imbalance, I suspect we'll learn more. But for now, I don't have a definitive answer for you. Jean checking in here. Uh, she says that she likes air fried potatoes with just a little bit of herb sprinkled on them. What's, what's your take on air frying? Are you on board the air frying train? Oh, yes. I love it. Uh, <laughs> it's terrific. It's a great way to make French fries. And like Jean said, sprinkle some herbs on them. It's terrific. Your kids won't know any better. Um, you can do other things like I make um, baked samosas with it or Indian pakoras with it. Um, I'll make tofu kebabs or tofu steaks. So it's so many great ways to use that air fryer. Definitely. It's healthy because we're not using oil. Um, we're just using this high flow hot air to get that um, baked crispy feeling, which is so satisfying without the fat and calories from oil. All right. And let's uh, give Claudia some advice here as we wrap things up here. She says that my grandmother's doctor recommended that she not eat any grains or seeds. So she basically eats meat, dairy, vegetables, and some fruits. She also has diabetes type two and hypertension. So what kind of conversations could Claudia have with her grandmother's doctor to school her up on the plant-based diet? Yeah. So, you know, Claudia is obviously worried about her grandmother's health. Um, you know, I would start by just starting the conversation about why why avoid grains and seeds. What was the thought process? Um, it, you know, what is that really about? Maybe the doctor thinks that avoiding grains will lower blood sugar, and that's why they're recommending it. Or sometimes they recommend avoiding seeds because of conditions called diverticulitis. So it would be really important to find out what is the thought process. And then um, really, you know, having a conversation about the health benefits of plant-based diets that in fact uh, grains and fruits and vegetables can actually help lower blood sugar. It, the potassium in fruits and vegetables can help lower blood pressure. So, you know, a little bit of educating the family member and the healthcare team could be really helpful here. Do you know if there have been any studies done on plant-based diets uh, specific to diverticulitis? So uh, not directly that I'm aware of, but we know that colon health improves with a high fiber diet. So um, when we don't consume enough fiber in our diet, we develop a condition called diverticulosis. And what that means is we develop these little pouches that stick out from our colon's wall. Our colon is a smooth tube. Um, and then with insufficient fiber, we can develop these pockets that stick out and they're called diverticulo, uh, diverticula or the condition is known as diverticulosis. And sometimes those pouches can become inflamed or infected. And so we know that eating a high fiber diet prevents diverticulosis. So um, that could then prevent inflammation, diverticulitis, because if you have fewer diverticula, you're less likely to develop diverticulitis. But as far as directly comparing um, diverticulitis in the setting of a plant-based diet, I'm not uh, aware of a research study about that. 
All right. Uh, Richard, just uh, really quickly want to say thank you for watching. I uh, see your nice comment there. Greatly appreciate it, my friend. And Gene, I know that you're experimenting with your air fryer. You say that you made falafel yesterday. Okay. You said it turns out delicious. Here's what I need from you, Gene. I need for you to continue to experiment with this air fryer and share your successes with us. Let us know what is the best recipes we could possibly do in an air fryer? We'll share them here on the show. Let's spread the wealth. Like, let's not keep delicious falafel to ourselves. <laughs> let's not be selfish about the falafel, okay, Gene? <laughs> All right, so if uh, you have a question for Dr. Ramon or Dr. Barnard, Dr. Michael Greger will even be on the show tomorrow. Keep on posting it in the comment section. That's all the time that we have for the doctor's mailbag today, but fear not because plenty more opportunities in the future. I guarantee you we look at each and every question that does cross our screen. So we save them, we log them, and hopefully we can get you an answer on a upcoming episode. You can also tweet them to us at PCRM or at Physicians Committee, uh, or at Chuck Carroll WLC, sorry, uh, using the hashtag exam room podcast. Now, Dr. Ramon, I hope that you're still there because I know that you are working on an incredible weight loss program coming up as well. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Uh, so um, I'm really excited about this program. This is a, a completely Zoom-based online program that we're launching on June 20th. We're going to meet Saturday um, from noon to 1.30 Eastern time, and it's open to everyone in the United States. And we will meet every week for 12 weeks and talk about um, diet, nutrition, how diet can play a role in weight loss, improving our health. And, and again, the best part of the program is the incredible peer support that our participants will get. So, you know, if there's a problem, it'll be a group of a few hundred people working on it together as opposed to just one person doing it by themselves. And um, this is really um, something that, you know, we learned about with the COVID-19 pandemic that as we started doing more Zoom-based programs that they were really quite effective. People really enjoyed them. So we thought we would take it to the next level and launch this program. So very excited to get this started. All right. And I'm excited as well being a, a weight loss guy. So I wish everybody that signs up for this nothing but the best of success. And I will tell you that although I lost a lot of the weight before going plant-based, the thing that I love so much, Dr. Rahman, about the plant-based diet is for the first time in my life, I don't have to worry about putting the weight back on. To me, this is the best, what a lot of people would call maintenance diet for keeping the weight off. And it really doesn't even become a diet at all. You know, it, it, you just change your lifestyle. But if you're tired of yo-yo dieting, if you're tired of losing and gaining and gaining more than you had lost originally and just getting heavier and heavier, I'm telling you right now, as a guy who uses this every single day of his life, it is the absolute best way to take charge of your health. And if you would like to make an appointment to see Dr. Ramon privately, you can do that. As a matter of fact, any one of the fine doctors and dietitians over at the Barnard Medical Center, you can pick up the phone right now and call 202-527-7500 to schedule your appointment or visit barnardmedical.org. Now accepting patients all across the country through telemedicine. You see a list of states right there on the screen. So if you live in California, New York, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Maryland, Virginia, Missouri, Arizona, Colorado, Massachusetts, and Kentucky, any one of those locations, you can make an appointment today. And we are trying to expand and add new states all the time. So stay tuned with that. Telemedicine visits are available. You don't even have to leave the comfort of your own home. All right, Dr. Ramon, greatly appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks, Chuck. All right. Now, tomorrow on the show, I already said this, but the one and only Dr. Michael Greger will be here to answer your questions. This could be this could be one of the biggest doctor's mailbags of all time because Dr. Greger will be here. Dr. Neil Bernard will be back on the show as well. It's going to be just absolutely an epic way to round out the week. Dr. Greger, by the way, one of the featured speakers at the upcoming International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine that we're going to be putting on August 6th through 8th for the first time. This conference, ICNM, completely online. So you can uh, register right now. CME credits are available, pcrm.org slash ICNM to register for that August 6th through 8th. Take a look at that speaker lineup. I mean, it is out of this world. We're going to have a lot of guests uh, who will be speaking there right here on the exam room live in the coming weeks. So pcrm.org slash ICNM is the place to go for that. But tomorrow, back here, 
noon Eastern on Facebook and on YouTube. Dr. Michael Greger, Dr. Neil Barnard, we're going to be here. We're going to chat. We're going to answer a lot of your questions. It's going to be epic. And thank you to everyone who has been so active in the chat box today. Jib the world. I wish that we could keep the chat going for a little bit longer, but my friend, join us tomorrow. We'll keep the conversation rolling. For everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much to our producers, Laura Anderson and Donna Steele. Until tomorrow, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based.